Sarah and Jennifer who are both from George Washington and they are in, uh, ex they have expertise in economics and global health and public health. And i um, especially excited to hear from them because we have been collaborating on at one of the sites um, where they've been collecting data in, in Bangladesh, but we'll hear about work um, uh, that they're doing in, in multiple sites around the world. Um, and I guess today we'll talk a lot about Jordan and Bangladesh. Uh, so thanks very, very much, uh, Sarah and Jennifer, for being with us. And, uh, and hopefully, like, I remember we actually originally scheduled this to be in person, but hopefully at some point we can, uh, we can fix that. Great. Well, thanks very much, um, Mushvik, for the invitation. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to present today and Ramadan Mubarak to those of you that um, observe. So Jennifer and I will be sharing the presentation today, um, talking about findings from our research on adolescence in Bangladesh and Jordan, that's part of the Gender and Adolescence Global Evidence Study. Um, these findings are on behalf of a large research team um, with researchers from the US, UK, Bangladesh, Jordan, Palestine, and others. And I'll provide a link to the website at the end of the presentation so you can learn more about um, the broad collaboration. Um, Jennifer and I are both relatively new to research in um, refugee settings, so that so we're particularly delighted to be presenting to this group, um, and we really look forward to your questions and insights on on you know new strands of research we may want to pursue in in the in the future. Um, also, you know, we're this is a very collaborative project, and so we hope that this also opens up scope for for future collaboration. Uh, next slide. So what we've decided to do today is to provide kind of an overview of the GAGE project and some of the research Jennifer and I are, are working on. Um, I think it sort of just highlights broadly what we're, what we're doing and hopefully um, provides you, um, you know, you, you learn, learn something new um, and are excited to hear more as this research progresses. I'll start by providing an overview of, of GAGE because I imagine many of you are new um, to the Gender and Adolescence Global Evidence Project, as well as why we think our adolescents are an important age group to study, particularly in refugee contexts. I'll then turn to a detailed description of our, our samples in Bangladesh and Jordan, which will be the focus today. Um, as Mushfik mentioned, we're lucky enough to partner um, with him and Austin and others on the Cox Bazaar, Bazaar panel survey, which is where the Bangladesh data um, comes from. I'm then going to hand it over to Jennifer, who's going to talk about findings related to three specific um, adolescent capabilities that map to our gauge conceptual framework, which I'll talk about in a bit. We decided to focus on um, education, bodily integrity, which include, includes violence and child marriage, as well as psych psychosocial well-being. Uh, Jennifer will talk about sort of the risk and, and protective factors for improved outcomes, diving deep into analysis on, on mental health. She'll also explore the role of adolescent programming in promoting resilience and sort of mitigating the impact of, of negative shocks. Um, she'll then hand it back to me. We'll, I will talk a bit about our, our COVID-19 um, research in both contexts and how that is exacerbating existing um, inequalities for these groups. And then I'll turn to some conclusions. We're happy to um, take questions throughout. Um, and we'll also try and pause um, you know, every 10 minutes or so to to, to open it up for, for any questions. Um, I wanna note from the start that, you know, although Jennifer and I are, are both economists and typically focus on randomized control trials and, and causal inference that um, today our presentation will largely be descriptive in nature, really building on the robust baseline data we have in these, these contexts. We will um, complement this with um, some, uh, new measurement work, some work combining gauge data with administrative data and some quasi-experimental analysis. We also have very rich qualitative data that supports our quantitative data, which I think allows us to dig deeper on certain things that um, perhaps typical studies are not able to, um, to dig into. And so um, from there, let's go to the next slide. So let me just first provide an overview of, of the gauge research um, agenda, which these two samples fit into, since I think probably for many of you, um, you're not familiar with, with this, this study. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
So GAGE is a nine-year mixed methods longitudinal research program exploring the gendered experience of adolescents 10 to 19 years globally. We're following around 18,000 um, adolescents, close to 20,000 um, boys and girls in sort of seven focal countries. So Ethiopia and Rwanda, Nepal and Bangladesh, and then Palestine, Lebanon, and Jordan. Ultimately, GAGE is, is interested in in exploring what works for whom, where, and why, so we can better support adolescent girls and boys um, in the future. The gauge, I think, in particular, is focused on the most vulnerable adolescents. So this includes working with refugee populations, but also oversampling um, adolescent girls who have experienced child marriage and adolescents with disability. So our, so we can actually kind of quantitatively say something about these these groups. I should note that GAGE is, is funded by um, FCDO in the UK and um, led by the Overseas Development Institute in the UK and Jennifer and I um, lead on the quantitative work. Next slide. So GAGE um, is guided by a what we call the three C's conceptual framework. So capabilities, context and change pathways. This has been really important um, in ensuring that these very varied research streams, both in terms of context we're working in, programs we're evaluating, partnerships, um, et cetera, sort of map on to some overall framework that helps speak more broadly to not only what, how adolescents transition from young adolescents to adulthood, but also how context interacts with that, with that transition. Our conceptual framework is built around six core capability domains that you see listed here. Um, this draws on Amartya Sen's work who argued that to achieve a dignified life, people need a sort of core set of entitlements or freedoms, which he calls capabilities. Engage, we've identified these six as capability areas that are particularly salient for, for adolescents. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, we're kind of focused, sort of dive deeper into three of them um, today. I think given both time constraints and given um, where we sort of see the most differences between Jordan and Bangladesh, as well as where we actually see some, some similarities. This you know, framework recognizes that adolescents um, context at the household, community, and national level are going to shape outcomes. And I think that's gonna be really highlighted in our findings today. And it also highlights the importance of reaching adolescents through different policies and programs. And we'll speak to some of that today as well. Um, and happy to talk more about this later on. Next slide. As I mentioned, we're following approximately 20,000 um, adolescents globally. These include quantitative surveys, girls and boys themselves, um, who in most cohorts were aged 10 to 12 or 15 to 17 when the research started. We also survey female and male caregivers, as well as community leaders, schools, health facilities, et cetera, to better understand the context these adolescents live in. The quantitative data is supported by qualitative research um, and annual participatory research. The qualitative data is you know, extremely um, detailed. They have um, methodologies and you know, Jennifer and I, neither Jennifer and I are, are, quantitative, uh, are qualitative experts, but we're going to also highlight, support our quantitative findings with some of the work that's coming out of the, of the qualitative side. Next slide. I want to just quickly motivate why we're focused on um, adolescents. Why is this sort of an interesting group to, to look at, um, particularly in refugee contexts? So adolescence is a time where physical transforma transformations are large, right? They're going through, through puberty. And as, in addition, um, children's place in the household changes dramatically and it changes very differently for boys and girls, right? Gendered norms become more, much more salient than in this time. It's also a time adolescents are particularly vulnerable um, to a wide range of risk-taking behavior um, that could jeopardize long-term outcomes. But the sort of malleability also um, ensures that this is a time where intervention um, may be particularly salient is why, and so why researchers have sort of now called on adolescents as kind of a window of opportunity for, for intervention, right? So building on the first 1,000 days to say this is another key touch point where um, intervention may be critical to 
promote um, improved outcomes as adolescent age. I think, you know, reaching adolescence, not only because of the, the their sort of the importance to um, good outcomes in adulthood, but adolescents are also a massive proportion of the population, right? And that's growing. So reaching adolescence is going to be critical for achieving the sustainability, sustainable development goals. And so we really need to understand um, more about their lives across varied contexts. Next slide. Adolescents um, specifically, but also refugees are a key population for sustainable development goal delivery. This is not an exhaustive list, but we listed here um, a subset of the sustainable development goals and how uh, ensuring that refugees are, are um, looked at and considered as an important group to reach these goals um, across these different do domains. This again is, is further emphasized by adolescents where um, the proportion of young people among the dis displaced is disproportionate, right? So when we look at the kind of displaced population globally, uh, about 50% are children as opposed to 30% of the global population. In Jordan specifically, um, who have taken in more than a million Syrian refugees, nearly a half are below the age of 18. Similarly, in um, the Rohingya refugees in, in Bangladesh, over 450,000 are children and 55% are under the age of 18. So sort of adolescents, um, refugee adolescents are, are sort of a critical, um, a critical group to, to understand um, in order to meet these sustainable development goals. Can I interrupt? Next slide, please. Sarah? Um, I was just wondering as you were speaking about um, refugees and adolescents, whether there's any biological or physiological reasons for us to believe that the act of displacement or instability or uh, exposure to violence, right, which often pre um, predates like displacement, um, is that differentially harmful for adolescents relative to the adults or relative to younger children, just getting a sense of uh, during like critical growth phases, uh, what what these um, what these types of kind of um, attacks on 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 people's psyche and and their physical health might might do to them? Yeah, great question. So you know, I think obviously the the shock of forced displacement affects all age groups and in different ways. I think for adolescents. Um, a few critical things. One, it often leads to fairly severe disruptions in, in education, right? So they're sort of either out of school permanently or um, out of school for long periods of time. That's in and of itself problematic for improved adult outcomes, but also, you know, particularly for girls can lead to um, early marriage, early childbearing, which has its own set of health consequences. And for boys can end up um, in child labor, again, with potential physical health consequences. Another particularly critical point for adolescents is um, mental health issues are one of the leading causes of disability among adolescents with, uh, I think alongside, um, I'm gonna forget, but basically it's one of the top three causes. And so we know, and we also know that the majority of, of mental health illnesses in adulthood start in adolescence. And so we can see how these sort of negative shocks from, from violence leading to um, higher symptoms of, of, of psychosocial distress in adolescents can then lead to longer term consequences. And Jennifer's gonna speak directly to um, the association between past exposure to violence and, and current mental health. And then just finally, I think the other point is, you know, we increasingly recognize um, the importance of, of nutrition during adolescence. And there's a lot sort of innovative new research around an adolescent growth spurt, right? So if you've missed out in childhood, you may actually be able to catch up if you intervene appropriately at, at adolescence. So again, adolescents going through forced displacement often lack access to enough nutritious food, which again is, is challenging. So I, I think there are lots of reasons why adolescents are gonna face certain important consequences from forced displacement. Sorry to extend the conversation a little bit, but sure. that's something I'm picking up from your from your response. Um, so it reminds me of, so this is my own version of really low quality qualitative data work, um, which is just like just having conversations in the Rohingya refugee camps, uh, same places where you and I are collecting data. Uh, 
um, with some you know knowledgeable uh, individuals within the camps, uh, Rohingya Rohingya individuals. So one of the complaints in Bangladesh has been, oh, you know, these Rohingyas. I mean, so people initially, thankfully, uh, welcomed the refugees, like remembering that we were refugees once. But then, as you probably know, that over time, people have gotten more and more um, um, annoyed or like just just getting fed up with the situation and that, you know, a lot of our land is taken up and there's no long term solution. You know, we don't see repatriation as an effect, but uh, as, as a feasible solution to what's going to happen. And so one of, you know, so there have been many complaints that have been merging. And one of the complaints is that fertility rates among Rohingya are, are very high. And you know they they have too many children. They have children early, etc. So when you were talking about early marriage risk, etc., right? So so um, uh, a, a person who has a university education was Rohingya but studied in a Burmese university. So he was trying to explain to me what exactly goes on there, and his explanation was that when uh, the military right used to come and uh, the Tatmada uh, attack the villages, right. They often had, because rape was used as one of the weapons, right? They often had their eyes on young girls. And one of the, I guess, the defensive strategies that the Rohingya develop is that whenever somebody is of age, like an adolescent, like they get married off and they try to get pregnant as quickly as possible because that would be a way to protect young girls. Yeah, so I mean, I think that resonates um, with Jordan as well as I think child... Uh, well, so I think two things. I think one, given concerns of um, rape, whether by uh, you know government forces or simply by other people in the in the community, I think there's a sense of of trying to ensure that the girl is is married and etc. to protect her from that possible um, violation. And then, in second, I think in in these contexts, it's also um, seen as a way to get additional financial support, right? Social, it's sort of a social protection mechanism. So I think in, in both of these contexts, we're um, it, seeing increased um, rates of, of child marriage as, for example, so in Jordan, for example, as some of the more global support dissipated, sort of there was a, a spike in, in child marriage because these households were looking for, for other ways to support. So I think there's sort of a sexual purity piece of it, um, and then as well as and sort of a protection around risks of, of rape, as well as a social protection angle. Jennifer, do you want to add? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, don't have it in the presentation here, but I've been working on a paper specifically around um, early marriage in the Roh among the Rohingya in the camps. And in the qualitative work there, one of the things that came out very strongly was exactly this um, issue that you discussed, which is um, early marriage as a way to protect the girls from um, gender-based violence and sexual violence, um, even continuing to occur in the camps um, as well. And I have a couple of stats on a few slides too, moving forward. Okay, great. Um, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about our sample. Um, next slide. Great. Um, so in Jordan, we have a little over 4,000 adolescents, Syrians, vulnerable Jordanians, Palestinians in Gaza camp, as well as a, a, a small handful of other nationalities, so Iraqi, Pakistani, etc. These adolescents were sampled from UNICEF and UNHCR lists, so they should be considered sort of representative globally of adolescents in camps and, and informal tented settlements. So ITS are informal tented settlements. Um, basically any, anyone living in a camp or ITS would be in one of these UNICEF and UNHCR lists. And then it should be considered representative of kind of vulnerable Jordanians and Syrians in host um, communities. The Syrians live in host formal camps and informal tented settlements. But Jordanians live in host communities and the Palestinians live in one specific camp, Gaza camp. The Syrians live in Zatari and Azraq um, camp in our, in our sample. At baseline, which was in um, late 2018, uh, the majority of girls and boys were 10 to 12 and 15 to 17. And you can see sort of e fairly equal distributions by, by gender and age. And we also have, as I mentioned, um, oversampled adolescents with disability and married adolescents to be able to sh 
kind of speak directly to those groups. Um, in host communities, we're working in four localities, Amman, Mafraq, Erbid, and Jirash. So again, the Jordan sample should be thought of as broadly representative of vulnerable adolescents um, in camp hosts and ITS communities. Next slide. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we um, our original survey took place in 2018, 2019, when the majority were 10 to 12 and 15 to 17. Along with adolescent surveys, we surveyed primary female caregivers and also conducted a school-based survey. We were then in, I was in Jordan in late February, 2020. We were about to launch our second round of data collection. And literally the day we were supposed to go to the field, Jordan went into a strict lockdown around COVID-19. Um, so we pivoted and conducted virtual surveys in May and July, 2020. And then again in October, 2020 and January, 2021. This is a sample where 99% of households have access to a cell phone or landline. And so it's a, a kind of a, a place that's well, that's very conducive to conducting virtual surveys. And although these surveyed rates, you know, 75% to 72% may be lower than what you would see in in-person surveys, I think they're, they look relatively good um, for COVID surveys and analysis suggests that the we're sort of missing adolescents largely at random, um, other than being slightly more likely to find um, adolescents from the younger cohort. Next slide. I thought it might be helpful to just provide some um, baseline characteristics from this sample to just help orient you to who these are um, and how, how they kind of vary um, across context. So I think one important thing that I hope comes out of our presentation today is, is not only the sort of variation between sort of the refugee uh, experience in Bangladesh versus Jordan, but also within these contexts, how varied it can be by, by gender and other characteristic. So first is just looking at social protection. So whether the household receives food or cash aid, um, you can see that the majority of Syrians do have access to some sort of, of social protection support with much lower rates for Palestinians and, and Jordans and Jordanians. Um, but you can also see when you look at um, location of residence for Syrians that social protection is basically universal in the camps, drops a little bit in hosts and drops further in, in ITS. And what, one thing that we'll see in Jordan is that, that the sort of social safety net system of the camp um, actually provides Syrians in camps a lot more support than in host. And I think that's gonna contrast to sort of the camp experience in, in Bangladesh. The second thing to highlight is just to get a sense of school enrollment, about three quarters of the sample were in school at, at baseline much lower rates among Syrians than compared to Palestinian and Jordanians. And again, we see that rates are slightly higher in camp, followed by hosts, but then dramatically lower in informal attendance settlements where only 42% were in school, speaking to the specific vulnerability of that, of that group. Next slide. Similarly, when we look at, at gender and marital status, um, mobility is sort of a, a important issue for, for these populations. And this has become um, increasingly apparent with the COVID research. So at baseline, 76% of the adolescents were able to leave their house on a daily basis. Um, but then you see this sort of massive gender divide, 87% of boys versus 67% of, of girls. And then when we look at the older girls by marital status, we can see that married, um, married girls have very little ability to move around, right? So only 28% of them were able to leave their house on a daily, on a daily basis. Similarly, when we break school enrollment down by, by gender and marital status, so one is we actually see that schooling rates are similar by boys, for boys and girls, and actually um, across the board, education outcomes in, in Jordan, whether it's enrollment, attainment, et cetera, tend to actually benef benefit girls over, over boys. Once again, we see that that married girls, not surprisingly, are very unlikely to still be in, in school. And so and that, that's sort of another group with specific vulnerabilities. Next slide. So now very quickly, and Jennifer is gonna dive a lot more deeper into the, these, these findings. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we're, we partner with, with Mushvik on the Cox Bazaar uh, panel survey, which includes a sample of Rohingya in the camps, as well as Bangladeshis in sort of near host and further host um, communities. Our, the gauge piece of this sample, once again, focuses on adolescents 10 to 12 and 15 to 17, with again, oversampling of adolescents with disabilities and, and married adolescents. Um, there's a very detailed listing and sampling process to sort of ensure that these samples are broadly representative of the camps and the, 
and the host with a couple of, of exceptions where we were unable to do surveys in a couple of the, of the camps. Um, next slide. So our sample here is a little over 2,000 adolescents who were first surveyed in, in sort of mid um, to late 2019. Once again, um, we also surveyed primary female caregivers. What's really nice here is that this data set links to Mushvik's broader data set, which has a lot of household and adult level information. Both of those data sets are now in the public domain. Um, so I think lots of additional research can be done exploiting um, Mushvik and Austin's data or Jennifer and my data and linking the two as, as needed. So it's really been great, sort of a great way to, to partner on surveys, interested in similar populations, but, but different questions. So once again, we also had to pivot to virtual surveys here, um, which while in host communities is, is doable, was particularly challenging in, in camps. And I think um, it's something we're gonna have to think about more as we move um, forward. Uh, but you know, we did reach about 70% at COVID round one and COVID R2 is actually ongoing now. So we won't be able to report yet on that second virtual survey round. Uh, next slide. Just to give you a sense of who this population is, um, I think, you know, first and foremost, a really important um, fact about the, the Rohingya is they basically have no access to formal education in the camps. And so you can see that camp, which is, is sort of synonymous for Rohingya, only 3.7% are enrolled in any kind of, of um, formal school. They do have access to some informal schooling, um, but that's fairly limited and, and Jennifer will speak to that as well. We also see that child marriage is much higher among the our Rohingya sample than it is in host, with again, the majority of, of, of marriages happening for, for girls and very few for, for adolescent um, boys. Similar to the note on mobility on the first slide, we also um, see you know, that these adolescents have some limited mobility here. Once again, the sort of massive gender divide with 78% of boys versus 44% of girls being able to leave their camp block or host community at least once per week. And so they, you know, these adolescents are living fairly constrained lives. Um, so any questions on, on, the, on the sample um, before I hand it over to Jennifer to dig into some of our findings? All right, Jennifer, um, over to you. Thank you. All right, so now um, I'm going to start talking a little bit about adolescent capabilities as um, Sarah mentioned previously, I'm gonna be focusing in on education and learning, um, bodily integrity with a look at exposure to violence and, and early marriage, and then psychosocial well-being. Um, and within the discussion of capabilities, I will also talk a little bit about some of the quasi-experimental work we're doing evaluating programming that's happening both in Jordan and in the um, Rohingya camps. And then I'll do a deep dive sort of into um, psychosocial mental health outcomes and, and exposure to violence pre-migration. Um, so first sort of starting with education and learning, I wanted to start on a positive note, which is that um, you know, adolescent aspirations are quite high in, in both of these contexts. So in both Jordan and Bangladesh, um, we see you know, in Jordan 80, over 80% of adolescents want to complete at least some secondary school. And in Bangladesh, in our sample, over 90% of adolescents want to complete at least some secondary school. Um, but there's you know, variation across, um, across populations, even within the various contexts. So in Jordan, you know, the lowest level of aspirations for secondary school is 60% of adolescents living in these um, in ITS in the um, tented communities versus 93% of Jordanian girls. Um, and then really where the stark difference comes in is aspirations for at least some university. So whereas in Jordan, um, you know, 70% of adolescents want to complete at least some university in Bangladesh, we see um, in this sample in Cox's Bazaar among the Bangladeshis and, and Rohingya adolescents, um, only about 45% aspire to at least some university. But this is you know, driven by wide disparities in, in populations. So in particular, Rohingya girls have very low aspirations for um, university attendance, which is likely partially reflective of like the realities of, of what will be possible for them. And um, as I'll be discussing, sort of access to education is, is basically non-existent for that population. 
Um, the other thing I, I wanted to point out um, is that, um, well, actually, I'll get to that in the next slide. Um, so then I also wanted to point out that, you know, parent parental aspirations largely reflect um, the adolescent aspirations themselves. Um, female caregivers, over 95% in both contexts want their child to attend at least some secondary school. Um, and then for university attendance, sort of reflecting what we saw among adolescents, um, um, adolescents, you know, 88% of, of parents are supportive of uh, university education in, in Jordan versus 32% of parents um, in Bangladesh. And again, wide disparities between sort of the Bangladeshi populations in the host communities versus um, the Rohingya population, where, you know, only 15% um, of Rohingya parents are aspiring for some university education. Um, I do want to note that actually even comparing the Bangladeshi uh, population in these host communities to other contexts in Bangladesh, we also do work in, um, in the slums around Dhaka and in Chittagong and Silet among uh, school going adolescents and aspirations in those contexts are, are much higher for universities. So in urban slums, about 71% of um, female caregivers aspire for university um, education for their for their children. And in um, Slot and Chittagong among these school going adolescents, it's about 93%. So this also points to the host communities that we're working with in Cox's Bazaar are also, um, you know, relatively more vulnerable. Um, so I mentioned that, you know, part of the disparity in aspirations comes from educational realities. And um, this points to access to schooling for the Rohingya is, is, well, formal schooling is non-existent. The Rohingya are um, restricted to camps and are not allowed to attend um, sort of local schools. So the schooling that they do have access to are these informal learning centers or temporary learning centers that are set up within the camps, which I'll talk a bit about more about in a moment. But they really cater to younger adolescents and children and the very basic level education. Um, and then more generally in, in these populations, um, restrictive gender norms prevent, prevent girls from attending school um, once they reach menstruation and, and beyond. Um, and you know, similar patterns in, in Jordan in terms of girls facing exclusion due to restrictive gender norms, but the picture in terms of access to education for um, refugees is, is a bit more positive. Um, so while initially uh, Syrian refugees faced some rates of exclusion from education, Jordan um, introduced a nationwide um, uh, double shift system that's increased access to formal education among um, Syrian refugees. And then they also have um, this Makani non-formal education platform that exists in the camps, host communities, and um, and tented settlements that provide education. Um, so just to give a little bit more context on these education programs that exist in both, in both contexts. Um, in Jordan, this uh, non-formal education programming that's available is called Makani, which translates to my spa uh, MySpace. And it's a UNICEF program that's reached over 100,000 vulnerable refugees in, in host community children um, in, in both host communities and refugee camps. And they have about 150 centers across Jordan. Um, it's a comprehensive approach. So part of, part of the Makani programming is around education, but it also is a well-rounded approach providing um, child protection services, um, childhood development, they want to provide um, life skills training and innovation labs for adolescents and, and youth, as well as integrating uh, health and nutrition um, programming through, through WASH services. And so as a whole, the Makani programs aim to promote and contribute to um, children's youth and, and parents' full development and well-being um, sort of across the board of, you know, physical, cognitive, and soci socio-emotional um, well-being. And so it's um, an integrative uh, program to improve um, well-being among adolescents. Um, in, in Bangladesh, the main access to education for the Rohingya adolescents living in the camps are these temporary learning centers that were set up um, by UNICEF and Save the Children in, in partnership with the government of Bangladesh. And 
the temporary learning centers are much more focused on trying to provide learning progression for children um, and adolescents, but very much focused on lower level, um, like young, young children with, with the learning um, and teaching, focusing on like learning to read and letters. And so, you know, our experience with uh, older adolescents through qualitative interviews is that they find the program sort of boring and, and, and um, like too low level. Um, and they, there was some discussion about expanding these temporary learning centers to provide the um, Burmese curriculum um, for the Rohingya adolescents in, in Bangladesh, and that was supposed to be expanded in 2020. However, that was put on hold due to the onset of, of COVID. Um, and in fact, these temporary learning centers have been completely closed since last year. Um, in April, and so access to education is again um, essentially non-existent for for Rohingya adolescents. So, around both of these programs, we have done some work, um, sort of evaluating uh, the impact of these learning opportunities um, and programming on adolescent outcomes. And at this point, given that we just have you know, baseline data, we're comparing outcomes according to Makani participation or the temporary learning center participation. Um, and then we control for factors that are relevant to selection into participation. So we're controlling for um, age, sex, and, and nationality, which um, have been found in other literature to be important drivers for participation. And then in addition, we control for household resources through um, asset indices, whether the household head is literate, um, whether it's a female headed household and the location. And so in Jordan, that's um, in a camp, ITFs or host community. And in, in Bangladesh, that's comparing, um, it's, we're focused part in the camps solely for the temporary learning centers. And so that's comparing sort of Teknaf to um, Ukia, which are the two Upazilas where the camps are, are located. And then um, we're, we estimate when we are doing this analysis, we also separate out our adolescents into the two age cohorts, um, 10 to 14 year olds and 15 to 17 year olds, because both programs um, focus on sort of adolescents under the age of 15. And most Makani participants are under the age of 10. Um, and then, as I mentioned already, the TLC participation is, is younger adolescents. So first, um, I just want to talk a little bit on access to education, and I have a couple of figures here, which is estimated using the, um, the Jordan data looking at the impact of Makani. And with the two figures, um, the first is for the young cohort 10 to 14 year old looking through a range of education outcomes, including enrollment in formal and non-formal schooling, as well as um, test scores. Um, focusing a little bit on math scores. And then the second figure is for the older cohort, 15 to 18 year olds. And one of the things I just wanna highlight, what you can see is that, you know, adolescents who are enrolled in Makani or have ever been enrolled in Makani are more likely to be currently enrolled in, in schooling and non-formal schooling and that they tend to have better test scores, but that these seem to be especially manifesting for the older adolescents, the um, 15 to 18 year olds, even though they may not currently be enrolled in Makani, sort of pointing toward um, the supportive role that Makani may have played uh, when they were younger to um, carry them forward for better outcomes in, in later, later adolescence. And then um, we don't have as wide of a range of, of outcomes um, for the Rohingya camps, but the temporary learning centers also increase the likelihood of enrollment in non-formal education by about 64 percentage points. Um, just to note that the temporary learning centers account for about 50% um, of the enrollment in education. Um, sorry, about 50% of adolescents are enrolled in the temporary learning centers for the non-formal education. So a lot of this is, is driven by the enrollment in the non-formal education centers them, um, themselves. Um, so now, you know, turning to violence, and here I'm going to talk a bit about more like daily violence that adolescents are facing um, in their lives. Uh, Sorry, Jennifer, just one Jordan, uh, question. Mm -hmm. One question from the chat before you go on is just the question is: Do the temporary learning centers include child-friendly spaces as as well? Um, how how exactly are they set up? 
Yeah. Um, so they do have um, child friendly spaces. I will um, have to check specifically on, on how those are structured and perhaps when um, Sarah takes back over in the second half and I can um, come back to respond to that toward the end. Thanks. Um, so in Jordan, sort of day-to-day -day, um, experience of violence um, has tends, in terms of reporting from adolescents, focuses around um, sexual harassment by adolescent girls is, is commonly reported. Um, in the qualitative work, there's discussion of boys and young men tend to stand around outside girls' schools as they leave and, and follow them home, and so this is a common occurrence. Um, nearly half of the adolescents are reporting violence at home, and this is potentially, you know, violent discipline um, from parents, but this is much more heavily, um, a higher burden is carried by boys with 42% of boys' mothers admitting to using violent discipline compared to 31% of, um, of girls' mothers. And we have a quote here um, from a Syrian mother talking about how um, she does not beat her daughter because this will affect her, but when I beat my son, he will be better. And sort of this viewpoint of um, variance and discipline between um, male and, and female children. And then um, bullying is, is common. So 46% of boys and 38% of girls report experiencing um, peer violence, um, which could include um, like physical violence as well as, as, as name calling. Um, the picture is really very similar in, uh, in Bangladesh where, um, you know, both camp and host communities, um, adolescent girls are reporting uh, sexual harassment and gender-based violence. Um, you know, 15% of, of married girls report having experienced some form of, of gender-based violence. Um, and then again, peer violence and bullying is, is common with 45% of adolescents experiencing peer violence. And this is across both camp and, and host communities. So I would note that um, peer violence is more commonly reported in, in host communities in this context where 54% um, uh, of adolescents reporting some form of peer violence in host communities versus 30% in camps. And one of the big um, challenges in terms of, of violence comes uh, with early marriage um, and uh, married adolescence, which we've already talked a little bit about um, earlier in the presentation. Um, but just to reiterate, in, in Jordan, 18% of the um, 15 to 17 year olds in the sample, almost entirely Syrian, were already married. And in Bangladesh, this, the share is a little lower, but we found in our own sample among 15 to 17 year old girls, about 12% of the females were, were already married. And among um, married adolescents in both Jordan and um, Bangladesh, among the Rohingya refugee camps, uh, the qualitative work very strongly presented um, evidence of, of gender-based violence. And so I've uh, chosen a selection of quotes here from, from both communities, um, these, two uh, these two quotes here, you know, girls are abused by their husbands are both um, in Jordan context. Um, you know, he used to pour water in my ears because these things don't leave any marks on the outside. In the Rohingya camps, um, IPV is happening within marriages, but it's very well known even to um, unknown girls. And so this is a quote from a 16 year old unmarried girl who um, says she has heard a lot about this from many persons when wives don't listen to their husbands, they're beaten. And, you know, just to point out that the solutions to these um, it, are not, um, are not well supported. And so in the Rohingya camps, there's a lot of reporting that there's no one reliable to report to, or they aren't listened to when they do report. And in, um, in Jordan, you know, one of the main outcomes is, is divorce in, in these settings. Um, so then turning toward uh, mental health, um, and then we'll kind of do a deeper dive. In our survey and what we focus on, we are measuring mental health primarily using the General Health Questionnaire 12, which asks about um, how you've been feeling in the you know, last two weeks compared to normal. And then we use the Child and Youth Resilience Measure um, to measure uh, resilience 
And in Jordan, what we find is that most adolescents are not psychologically distressed and that they are emotionally resilient. So um, using the general health questionnaire 12 um, to measure psychological distress, around a third of, of adolescents had scores that demonstrated emotional distress. Um, but this varied across uh, populations. And so in the Jordan context, older girls are 11% more likely to be distressed than, than older boys. Um, and in Bangladesh, you know, rates of emotional distress measured by the GHQ-12 are much are lower, around half of what's reported in, um, in Jordan, but there are significant differences between older and younger adolescents with, you know, 20% of older adolescents reporting psychological distress compared to 10% of younger adolescents. And actually the most affected group in Bangladesh is around the older males and particularly in the Rohingya camps. And in the qualitative work, one of the major concerns that came out is um, financial reasons and um, boys, you know, shouldering a majority of the concern about the, you know, work that they need to do to contribute to household incomes. Um, so again, kind of thinking back to the programming and, and what exists and um, how we might be able to think about supporting um, the psychosocial well-being of adolescents, we have looked at among younger adolescents the role of the Makani programming and the temporary learning centers on, you know, resilience and um, psychosocial mental health as measured by the GHQ-12. And what we find in both contexts, and this is particularly driven by young boys, and so these are the results that I'm showing here, is that being currently enrolled in um, Makani or currently attending an NGO program um, reduces the GHQ-12 score by about um, 0.3 points. And in Bangladesh, this translates to about an 11 percentage point reduction in the likelihood of experiencing psychological distress, um, which is, you know, given that among young adolescents as a whole, around, you know, 10% of them were experiencing psychological distress. This is quite a large, large effect in that, you know, adolescents that are engaging in this programming are um, having better outcomes, um, suggesting that supportive environments are, are crucial in these cases. Um, and then finally, I do just wanna mention, you know, one, uh, again, coming back to early marriage and the negative impacts that this has on adolescents as, you know, alongside gender-based violence, one of the things that we found in some recent work um, I've been doing on early marriage in the Rohingya population is that when you look at um, PHQ-9 scores, which is another, um, you know, clinical diagnostic tool for a moderate to severe depression, 37% um, of our married adolescent girls exhibit signs of moderate to severe depression um, compared to 11% of the older unmarried girls in the Rohingya camps. And so, um, you know, early marriage, although maybe uh, potentially protective, is, is causing a fair amount of, of distress. Sorry, Jennifer, okay. one other question before you um, yep. move on. Um, so is divorce socially acceptable or are there some repercussions for girls who get divorced, do they go back to live with their parents um, as probably they're sort of not economically active. I can speak to Jordan in that um, it's, yes, there, you know, is stigma um, associated with being divorced. And yes, they do typically go back to live in their homes, but it, it, it has become so common. So, you know, kind of, and, and these, many of these girls do then go into marry again fairly quickly. So yes, stigma, but it's at least in Jordan is, has become um, uh, very common. And I don't know, Jennifer, if you can speak to, to Bangladesh. Yeah, in the Rohingya context, um, the divorce did not come up um, strongly in the, in the research on early marriage. And, and my understanding from the context is it's not, um, it's not socially acceptable and it's, it's um, and so it, it's not really an option um, in that context. Um, so just I'm going to turn you know, to some about, work that we're doing. We have doing. about 25 minutes left total. Yeah. So I'm going to, I think some of this motivation slides, I'll be going through a little bit quickly um, since we've already kind of provided that motivation. So what I want to talk about here, and I think I'll focus a little bit on mental health measurement, 
um, is some work that we're doing using children's drawings uh, to, to measure as, as potential measures of, of mental health in these um, contexts. So I have a few slides here sort of motivating mental health in adolescence, which we already discussed earlier, and um, you know, degrees of uh, mental health uh, illness among, among refugees. So I'll go, go through this quickly. But what I do want to um, stop and talk about is that, you know, a big challenge in terms of measuring mental health in these contexts is, um, you know, how to assess psychological distress for very young adolescents, particularly when we're talking about 10 and 12 year olds. Although, you know, the GHQ-12 has been validated in, in multiple populations, administering these complex survey instruments in, you know, potentially um, fragile contexts can be can be difficult, and especially in cases where adolescents have limited education and are struggling to understand concepts. And so, one promising methodology is children's self portraits um, and and free drawings. And these have been used in clinical settings as a gauge of, of mental health and other contexts. And there has been some recent research using children's drawings for measuring psychological impacts in um, in field studies. And so, we're building on this to. Um, look at the feasibility in, in our context as, as well. Um, so, you know, the empirical literature has established link between some characteristics of children's self-portraits and free drawings um, and elements of psychological health. And I'll show some examples of what that might look like in a couple slides. Um, and the nice thing about drawings is that if we can associate, you know, it, features of drawings to mental health, we might be able to learn um, things about mental health that would be difficult to obtain from direct questioning, either because um, adolescents don't want to respond directly or don't understand the, the concepts themselves. And so what we're doing with these drawings is um, we basically give the adolescents a sheet of paper and a set of colored pencils and a, and a flat place to draw, and we um, give them simple instructions. Um, so we do both free drawings in the gauge context, and then we have um, from another data set uh, self-portraits. But essentially the instructions are, I'd like you to draw a picture on this piece of paper using these pencils um, and feel free to draw whatever you're thinking about. It can be a picture of anything and they have 15 minutes. And if it's a self-portrait, then we just specify that. Um, so we have these drawings from two data sets among um, Syrian refugee families. And so one was collected in 2016 um, by um, colleagues at University of San Francisco, Bruce Weidick, um, Rafael Panulio, and um, Stephanie Smith collaborating with us on this work. And then um, they have data on children five, ages five to 12. And then we have the Gage Jordan data that we've been talking about today, focusing particularly on the Syrian adolescents aged um, 10 to 12. And um, for the USF data set, we have portraits, um, and for the Gage Jordan data set, we have um, free drawings. And then we're able to use these surveys that collect information on household characteristics and government of origin in Syria and pair it with exposure to trauma, um, which we measure using the Syrian Revolution Martyr Database, which contains information on um, sort of number of martyr deaths in governance um, by you know, timing. Um, in, in Syria. And so we're able to link when adolescents travel to Jordan from Syria to sort of the timing um, of, of martyr deaths um, in Syria to measure the exposure, the extent of exposure they've had to this violence. And then in the future, we do have drawings in the Gage Bangladesh data as well, although it's currently still in, in Bangladesh so that we could you know, bring that into this work as well. So just um, as an example of how features of drawings might be used to measure um, mental health. So Tibbetts, 20, um, Tibbetts in some previous work in 2013 has identified some features of drawings that can be linked to PTSD. And so some of those might be um, like in this drawing of the flag, you know, lack of concern with integrating background into drawing perhaps. Um, you know, focus on symbols or memories of trauma. Um, so that could be, um, here is a picture, um, it's like um, a man aiming a gun at another person. And so these are both features that have been associated with PTSD. 
And then there's other literature such as work um, by Watteson um, as old, as far back as 1971, linking features of drawings to anxiety and depression. And so one might be drawn in dark colors. So this is the black and white picture of a hat or with a single color of a house, excuse me. Um, or even, you know, positive features of drawings indicating low anxiety or happiness. So having, you know, bright colors, et cetera. And so then this is how we've had, we have these drawings and we're, when we code them according to these features and then are able to classify them into indicators of depression, anxiety, or PTSD that we then use as measures of mental health. Um, and then um, we estimate the relationship of these measures of mental health um, that we build from the indices um, using a simple regression outcome is our index of anxiety, depression, or PTSD. And then X is our, um, is a vector of refugee experiences that includes exposure to violence or simulation. And then we control for various um, household characteristics. And what we find is that um, exposure to violence as measured by the Syrian martyr, martyr database is um, positively correlated or indicating higher levels of PTSD as measured by these drawing indexes. Um, both in the USF data among the five to 12 year olds in 2016 and in the Gage Jordan data um, um, measured more recently in 2018 2019. And then in this data, we're also able to measure um, integration of the Syrian refugees into the Jordan community, so those living in host communities. And we can see that um, ad adolescents that have been reintegrated into Jordan society, that um, this is these supportive environments um, are associated with reductions in, in um, experience of, of PTSD in the USF data, and then also reductions in experience of depression um, and anxiety across, across both data sets. And so what we see is that these measures of anxiety, depression, and PTSD as indices of uh, mental health, um, sorry, indices of, of drawing features are associated with these past exposures to violence. So then what we want to do is identify in particular features of these drawings that are associated, uh, most associated with exposure to violence, and then whether these same features of drawings can be associated with more traditional measures of mental health, such as the GHQ-12. And we do that using um, LASSO, which um, is a tool to identify um, to identify basically the most important correlates with an outcome of interest. And so we use LASSO to estimate the following specification where we have our outcome in this case is now exposure to violence and we're trying to predict the violence with drawing features, which we have here um, in this D feature. And we penalize these drawing features in order to identify the most important drawing features um, in this case. And then we have our um, control variables that we don't penalize that are household characteristics. And we estimate this lasso separately on each of the two data sets, the USF data set and the gauge data set. And what we find is in both cases, um, the drawing of aggressive action figures is um, retained as being highly predictive of exposure to violence. And so this is the most important feature. But, I, but you can also see other features that were retained through the, through the lasso estimation um, in each data set as well, including you know, shading of face of body, um, um, monster pictures as also being positively correlated with, um, with violence. And so what we're seeing is that there are strong correlations of these drawing features um, as being able to predict um, higher exposures of, of violence measured through the Syrian database. Um, and then just very quickly, we then took those features that were identified as predictive of, of violence and can also show that they are correlated also with um, signs of psychological distress, which we mainly point out here to say that these features are identifying something that is correlated with, with mental health um, as well, so that we aren't just talking about violence and drawing, but, um, but also can really link this back to mental health. So I will wrap up there and, um, and hand back to, to Sarah. Great, um, thanks, Jennifer. Um, you know, I think th there's a number of questions in, in the chat, and I'll make sure we I leave you know five minutes to to get back to these. I mean, I think 
mental health measurement in general, mental health measurement among adolescents, um, you know, is something where continued research is, is needed. One thing that, um, you know, for example, it seems like some of the rates of, of symptoms of psychological distress are lower among these populations than typical adolescents in low and middle income countries. And that may be partially because, you know, anxiety is such a, is almost normalized for them. And so I, I think we need to do a bit more to, to figure that out. And then I think, you know, one, there was a query around access to, to services. And I think, you know, yes, there's stigma around mental health. And then even if you identify it, there's limited access to services. I know there are a lot of innovative, low cost um, methodologies being explored, but I really think this is, is, you know, a place where um, a lot more research is, is needed. Okay, so I, I have about 10 minutes. Um, so I'm not gonna really do this, this part justice, but given that I think COVID-19 is, is on the top of our, our minds and particularly given the massive increases in cases in, in Bangladesh, as well as in, in Jordan, um, I think is, is particularly uh, salient for these settings. I'm gonna skip, um, most of these slides, but just highlight kind of a few things that have come out of our of our research. Uh, next slide. So, so very quickly, just to, you know, for those of you that perhaps don't don't work in these contexts and haven't been following what's happening with COVID, that'd be nice to just provide a, a, a graphic of kind of the trajectory of COVID-19 cases over time and key policy moments. Of most relevance for this conversation is that when we conducted the, the first round of COVID data collection back in, in May. Um, Jordan had one of the most strict, the strictest lockdowns globally and cases were very, very low. Um, when we are resumed our second round of field work in late 2020, early 2021, um, they had largely uh, relaxed those restrictions. Cases were um, increasing pretty dramatically and schools tried to reopen briefly, but then had to shut down. Um, and in fact, you know, Last March was actually the highest case caseload in Jordan thus far. And so there, I think it, things are starting to, to turn, um, but sort of, you know, second round of data collection was taking place when, when there was a fairly high rise. Next slide. So in Bangladesh, it's, it's uh, I guess sort of a similar story. Um, when we conducted data collection in, in um, April, May, 2020, um, the government had actually imposed a very strict lockdown on Cox Bazaar specifically to prevent the spread of the virus in the camps. Um, this included um, closing all the, the learning centers and sort of other non-essential um, NGO programs. Data collection, as I mentioned, is still ongoing um, right now, um, but similarly, cases are rising dramatically. Um, Bangladesh announced another lockdown on April 5th with sort of a more severe lockdown set to start to tomorrow. Uh, Complementing this, there were actually horrible fires in the camps, um, sort of further, uh, um, you know, preventing challenges on their lives. And, and up to today, as far as I know, not a single Rohingya has received a, a vaccination. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Right. So, you know, adolescents obviously are not really being affected by the, the direct health impacts, um, but school closures and, and the economic disruption um, has been huge. We uh, collaborated to develop a module just asking for both the adult and the adolescent, their perspective on, on how COVID has impacted their community across a variety of different dimensions. And as you can see, almost everyone um, notes that people have lost jobs and schools have closed and also lots of people noting increases in violence, um, people using shisha and other types of substances, uh, people unable to get medical care and then issues around self-harm um, and suicide. And this has also come out in the qualitative of work. So this just highlights you know, how dramatic this, this shock has been um, as perceived by these households. Next slide. Similarly in Bangladesh, so here these are from the adults perspective comparing coast and camp and once again, you know, most households have effect, had some sort of, of um, employment or income loss, schools have closed, and people are perceiving, you know, increased anxiety, increased violence, um, food insecurity, etc. So the, you know, the, while the direct health effects um, have not been at least to date, perhaps as large as they have been in, in places like the US, you know, the lockdowns in these contexts have sort of massively disrupted these people's lives. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
All right, so I'm going to just focus on a few key um, results. Um, this is the first one, which is around food insecurity. So we asked the adolescents how many meals they had with animal protein yesterday. This also includes some data from our other um, sites. And I guess perhaps not surprisingly, given the magnitude of the economic shock, you can see that when you compare baseline, so this is pre-COVID to COVID round one, um, which is the early pandemic and to Jordan in, in COVID round two, you can see that the number of meals with animal protein dropped um, substantially. And in Jordan, we, we still haven't seen any um, sign of, of recovery. So the economic effects and then its translation into food insecurity, which as sort of Mushfik and I were talking in the, in the beginning, I think the nutrition is particularly important for, for adolescent growth. And so this is something to be, to be concerned about. Next slide. In Jordan, we can also further look at um, differences in experiences between host informal tented settlements and camps. Um, here, we're looking at whether adolescents experienced hunger in the last four weeks. So again, you see these sort of increases at, at COVID R1 and in both host and ITS, really no sign of, of um, recovery. But in camps, you can see that uh, it does look like there has been um, some improvement and this points to the um, extensive access to social protection that adolescents have in, in camps that is not, um, for, not, is not there in, in host and ITS communities. Next slide. So I'm not gonna do this justice, but I really just wanna quickly note that Jordan has actually done a, a fantastic job relative to other countries in terms of um, quickly pivoting to online learning and given the access to um, technology, et cetera, you can see that many, um, most kids are able to engage in some learning through this Ministry of Education program. Even so, you can see through these qualitative quotes that you know it's unclear how much learning is actually happening. And I, I think there's a lot of concern about what happens when schools um, reopen after this sort of lost year of, of education. But you know, again, relative to other contexts, Jordan has, you know, I think is, is a exemplar in terms of ability to pivot to, to online learning and I think benefits from, from its, its wide access to, to internet. Uh, next slide. In Bangladesh, you know, it's a bit uh, of the opposite. Um, so I'll just focus on the purple um, shape. Only 6% of Bangladeshis report using any kind of media to continue learning. And there's literally only one Rohingya adolescent in our sample who's had any sort of, of access to, to learning through media during, during the, the pandemic. So this, you know, I think highlights um, the fact that the pandemic really is going to exacerbate these pre-existing inequalities both across and, and within countries and we're going to need to think of a programming that's going to particularly focus on that next slide okay so i'm going to i guess quickly go through a couple final themes so you know we think a lot about about school closures and how that has isolated adolescents you know, Mushfik was saying he had to come back from the beach because his his son wanted to interact with friends again. And, and you know, social connectedness is actually extremely important for, for adolescents and isolation is associated with mental health, anxiety and other outcomes. So he did good by his by his son. Um, so this highlights basically how isolated many of these adolescents are um, prior to the pandemic pretty much everyone was interacting with a friend or non-household member at least once in the last seven days. But as you can see um, in, in Jordan, only about 30% of, of both boys and girls were interacting with friends at all. Some signs of recovery, right? So we see by COVID round two, um, those number have increased, but importantly, they've increased a lot more for, for boys than girls. And so girls are still, are sort of increasingly disadvantaged in terms of these social connections. And then looking at the Cox Bazaar panel survey for round one, this really just highlights the gender discrepancies in, in social connectedness and how, um, how much girls have been sort of uh, socially isolated from their, their networks. And I think, you know, alongside school return, we need to think about how we re, you know, reestablish these, these social, um, these social connections. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Um, so I very quickly on this, so, um, you know, it sounds like from the comments that a lot of you are interested in, in sort of measurement issues as well. Um, so 
you know, and so one challenge we face in pivoting to a virtual survey is we have a lot of sensitive questions and very rigorous policies around connecting adolescents to services if they, you know, self-report, um, you know, whether it's exposure to violence or something else. And so we didn't feel that we could um, adequately protect their privacy or connect them to services in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So instead of acting directly about um, exposure to violence, we developed a series of vignettes that basically asked about whether a specific type of violence was a challenge for adolescents like them and whether they thought it had increased since COVID. And so this kind of gives you a sense of the types of questions we were asking and you know, the, the proportion of the population that was uh, and saying that this was a challenge that had increased since COVID as a way to get a sense of how the, the pandemic is, is affecting violence as well as things like access to um, feminine hygiene products. Um, next slide. And just the same sort of uh, set of vignettes for, for Bangladesh. And I think in general, um, you know, highlighting violence is, is pervasive and that the, there has been some increases since, since COVID-19. Next slide. So I'll just end with this finding um, before um, opening it up for any final questions. So, you know, there's a lot of concern around whether COVID-19 is going to exacerbate um, child marriage, right? So I think, you know, we've highlighted the particular vulnerabilities of girls who are already married and our COVID-19 findings indicate that they have also, they have been disproportionately affected along many dimensions. But obviously there's also concern about currently non-married girls and whether this is gonna sort of accelerate their transition to, to marriage. Well, I think it's too early in our quantitative data to be able to look at changes in, in marriage rates. An interesting dichotomy appeared when we asked them whether they thought their pressure to marry had decreased or whether they worried about marrying earlier. We actually see that, that quite a few adolescents actually believe that the pressure to marry has, has decreased um, in both Bangladesh and, and Jordan. This could be for multiple reasons. One is marriage brings a financial burden and many of these households simply can't afford that right now. Second, marriage comes with a ceremony and, and lots of people gathering and COVID doesn't allow that to, to happen. And then third, you know, sort of getting back to some of the conversation um, Jennifer and, and Mushik was having is I think given that girls are stuck at home, there's less concern about um, their sort of sexual purity and their exposure to um, kind of uh, violence outside of the household. And so perhaps also a little bit less um, rush to get them married and have kids, um, et cetera. On the other hand, you know, we do have a other subset of the population who are concerned about marrying earlier. And so it'll be, you know, one of the beauties about this data being embedded in, in longitudinal work is we'll be able to see over time um, what actually happened with, with marriage rates as a result of COVID and, and whether, you know, this, we are actually seeing this, this dichotomy. And, and this actually comes out in a lot of our COVID data is, you know, certain households saying they're getting a lot more support, others saying they're getting a lot less. And so exploring those dichotomies in, in attitudes, um, I think will be important in looking at sort of post COVID um, recovery. Next slide. And if you can just go to the conclusions, Jennifer. Great. So I basically we you know highlighted some of the vulnerabilities as adolescents looked at risk of and protective factors and explored the impact of, of COVID. Um, you know we, I think we have a lot more to say, but hopefully this has given you a broad sense of, of our, what our research is is about. Next slide. As I mentioned, you know this is longitudinal work that will continue through 2024. Um, so we have one to two more rounds in each each context to both look at post COVID recovery improve measures and understand the transitions to adulthood. We're very deeply engaged with policymakers globally um, to ensure that research findings inform policy and programming. All data will be publicly archived. Um, so, you know, this, as we go, this data will be available for others. And we do really welcome broad multidisciplinary um, collaboration and hope that some of you will reach out to us with, um, you know, with, with research ideas or, or desire to, to collaborate. Next slide. Uh, next slide. It's a ton of, of gauge publications on the, the website. Um, I encourage you to go look at it if any of this has interest to you. And then final slide. 
and just here's our contact information and, and the website and, you know, really appreciate the, the discussion today. Um, as I know, I haven't been able to get to all the questions in, in the chat box, but I realize, I realize we're, we're out of time, but happy to follow up, you know, for you to follow up um, by email and, and happy to answer those, those questions. So really appreciate you giving us the opportunity to present these, these findings um, and look forward to further discussions. I uh, thank you to both uh, Sarah and Jennifer uh, for the really nice presentation and give an overview. And I'll just add to that, that um, uh, they've, they've both been wonderful people to collaborate with. So this uh, invitation to collaborate that they've sent out broadly, I, uh, I'm, I'm just endorsing the fact that they're wonderful to, to work with.